so we are very happy uh, to have Daniel Mazaj from uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies for this uh, for this next seminar in the Quantum Encounter series. And um, many of us know Daniel for his work on the conformal bootstrap, and actually that's what we invited him to talk about. But uh, apparently he has some work in uh, where which even though it's based on from bootstrap techniques is actually on something even more maybe exciting for some people about uh, automorphic forms and their spectra so Daniel, please uh, uh, it's all yours okay great Th thanks a lot Slava and uh, thank thanks for inviting me to give this talk yeah well, it's a great pleasure uh, what, what, I'll, what I'll be telling you about today is based on some uh, upcoming work done in collaboration with Peter Kravchuk and Sri Pal. And there were also some uh, very nice, interesting papers uh, related to, to what I'll be telling you about today. So first one by Hinterbichler and Bonifacio last summer, I mean, last summer of last year, and another one by Bonifacio himself, summer of this year. Uh, okay, so what, what, is the, what is the basic idea? So somehow the, the main, the main point of this work is to use some ideas and techniques from the from bootstrap to, to prove some new rigorous bounds on the spectrum of the Laplacian or more generally automorphic forms on uh, on hyperbolic surfaces. Okay, so uh, let me let me let me set it up mathematically. So during the during the rest of this talk, X is going to be a, a Riemann surface. Which I'll take to be compact without a boundary. Compact, uh, no boundary. And uh, we can we can choose some hyperbolic. Well, we're going to choose some hyperbolic metric on this uh, Riemann surface. So GAB is a hyperbolic metric. So that that means the the scalar curvature, which is usually defined as one half of the Richard curvature is minus one. So I'm going to normalize it to be minus one. And uh, with this uh, with this data, we can uh, we can define the Laplace operator on X with this metric. So Laplace operator is just you know the usual thing contracting covariant derivatives with the inverse metric. And then you can study the Laplace equation. So there's a natural spectral problem, which is to find the complete set of eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the Laplace equation. Oh, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues going from zero to infinity. Okay, so the, the, the surface is compact. So it has some, this, uh, the Laplace equation has some discrete spectrum starting at, uh, at zero. Zero, course, zero eigenvalue is just the constant function. Then there is some non-vanishing gap to the first eigenvalue. And then there is some discrete spectrum going off to infinity. Um, okay, so that, this is a very, very interesting uh, problem to try to understand the spectra, which has been studied uh, you know, by, by many mathematicians and lots of exciting works. Uh, so what, what am I adding today? So today I will, I will introduce some new technique for proving uh, constraints on the spectrum of the of, of spectrum of the eigenvalues, and in principle also on the some eigen some overlaps of eigenfunctions, but uh, I'll, I'll focus on the on the spectrum of eigenvalues. So in particular, I'm going to prove some upper bounds upper bounds on lambda lambda one. So this problem is very analogous to to the to proving upper bounds in the context of conformal bootstrap on the on the gap in the spectrum of uh, of local operators and it will turn out that this uh, this upper bound that uh, I'll prove today is actually saturated by some interesting surfaces for example the bolza surface the klein quartic and so on or at least at least nearly saturated we can't be quite sure whether it's exactly saturated or or just nearly saturated okay so what, why why is this interesting well, one basic point is that uh, th th there is there's no analytic formula for these eigenvalues. So it's, it's not an integrable problem. So it, there's just no way to analytically solve for these eigenvalues. And this is, this is a reflection of the fact that the Laplace equation is, a, is basically the Schrodinger equation corresponding to, the quant to quantizing the geodesic motion of a particle, so a free particle on the, on the hyperbolic surface. And that is known to be a chaotic, uh, classically chaotic problem. There's, some, there's ergodicity, mixing, and 
uh, there's just no way to solve solve everything analytically and uh, okay so that's uh, in, in and you, you can say that the, the corresponding quantum version so this laplace equation is, is one of the simplest examples of, of a quantum chaotic model i mean the, the details depend on the types of the surface but uh, yeah that, I, I think i just want to leave it there it's, it's basically a, a quantum chaotic model um well but but usually the so the the chaos shows up in the in the high energy spectrum so the, 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 you know, the things like the random matrix statistics and so on you can study them by looking at the eigenvalues for for a very large index or very large eigenvalues but but today the focus will be on the low energy spectrum like lambda one lambda two and so on and the, this low energy spectrum is also important uh, in in various uh, parts of pure math for example one of the most important conjectures in this in this field is the Zellbrick's one quarter conjecture which says that uh, for a class of surfaces namely those which come from quoting the upper half plane by congruent subgroup sl2z there is a lower bound on lambda one which is one quarter so Zellbrick's conjecture which is itself related to various results in, in number theory uh, says that for for some gamma for, for, for some x which you know is the congruent subgroups of SL to Z. There is a lower bound, one quarter. But uh, okay, today I'm certainly not going to prove a Selber conjecture, but I'm going to prove some upper bounds on lambda one. So just to give you a sample result, uh, here here is here is here is something that we'll we'll show. Uh, so if you consider genus two close to hyperbolic surfaces, then there is a moduli space. It's a three complex or six real dimensional moduli space. And uh, one thing that we'll show is that there is a universal upper bound on lambda one on this genus two moduli space. So for all genus two hyperbolic surfaces, there is an upper bound on lambda one. So our bound is that lambda one is less than 3.838977. Which uh, which you can compare compare to the previous best known bound that's due to Yang and Yao, so Yang and Shington Yao proved uh, in 1980 that uh, lambda one for all genus surfaces must be uh, smaller than or equal to four. And now you can also compare lambda one to various surfaces, and for there is a special hyperbolic surface of genus two, which is known as the Bosa surface, is the one which is the highest symmetry group in the entire genus two moduli space. And for that one, lambda one is equal to 3.8388873. Okay, so it's it's pretty close to being so our bound is being pretty close to being saturated by Bosa surface. It differs on the fifth decimal place. Okay, so in, in the rest of the talk, I'll explain to you how to how to get this bound and uh, I'll explain more, more generally the method for getting these bounds. So that, that's the mathematical motivation, but there's also a physic, physics motivation, which is why I originally started thinking about it. And that's that's uh, roughly speaking that, uh, well, the, the method that I'll explain is very close to the usual conformal bootstrap. And in a conformal bootstrap, we have a funny situation that we have like some infinite set of equations for infinitely many unknowns. And we don't really know how to solve them. So we really only just know, know uh, in, in more than two dimensions, the, the only solutions of those bootstrap equations that we really have nailed down is free theory. And uh, we don't really know how how to sort of analytically or yeah, uh, arbitrary precision solve the all the equations if you don't want free if you want to exclude free theory so it's like to to you know to solve the 3D Ising model using the bootstrap so it, it, instead it would be you know it would be nice if we had some kind of mathematical machine which automatically output outputs solutions of the conformal bootstrap rather than trying to solve the equations sort of one by one and as I'll explain these hyperbolic manifolds are are a toy model for the situation. So there, for, for each hyperbolic manifold, you can define a set of correlation functions. You can define local operators. You can expand the correlation function in conformal blocks uh, for for the SL2R group, and and uh, you can say that each hyperbolic manifold is a manifest solution of this slightly modified set of bootstrap equations. So maybe by, by studying this problem, we can learn more about the usual conformal bootstrap. But th this is of course much more speculative. Okay, and, and finally, maybe another possible motivation is that it would be uh, I'm secretly dreaming to, to get mathematicians more interested in the conformal bootstrap. 
So maybe mathematicians can, can help us solve the 3D Ising model if they, they realize that uh, what we are doing uh, is interesting and makes sense. A anyway, so that's uh, enough of the general blah, blah. And uh, uh, I don't know, uh, let, let, me, let me just go and set up the mathematical problem. Uh, just unless there are... And where is the exact value is coming from? Which which exact value the oh oh yeah good so this is sorry this is not an exact value this is a you can you can get the value for the Bosa surface by numerically solving Laplace equation on the on that surface using using finite element method or or something like that so it, it's not known to arbitrary precision. Okay. Okay, so now, now a big part of this talk will be a, will be sort of review of standard mathematical results about hyperbolic surfaces. So mathematicians, please bear with me, but uh, yeah, it will also set up the, the problem for uh, later on. Okay, so the, the point is to think of, uh, think of uh, X as a quotient of the upper half plane. H, so the upper half plane, it, of course, the usual, uh, it's par we'll parameterize it by X and Y, where X is arbitrary real number, Y is positive. And there is a natural metric on the upper half plane, which uh, takes this form. Now it's normalized so that the scalar curvature is minus one, it's one over Y squared. And uh, the, the central, central role in this talk will be played by the group of orientation preserving isometries of this, of the upper half plane which is PSL2R. So orientation preserving isometries is this following group. I'll denote it G and it's PSL2R. So it's the set of two by two real matrices with unit determinant. Okay, so A, B, C, and D are real and quotiented by the center, which is plus or minus identity. So identity acts trivially. So plus or minus identity acts tri trivially. And uh, well, the way this acts, so when you when you write Z to be a point in upper half plane, uh, X plus I, Y, then Z gets mapped to A, Z plus B. So this, this, these matrices just act as usual by Mabius transformations. Okay, and uh, this means you can think about uh, the upper half plane as the quotient of G by maximal compact subgroup K. So K is, K is gonna be the maximal compact subgroup, which is just the uh, SO2, SO2R inside uh, PSO2R. So K consists of matrices. So let me denote an element of, of K by K theta. It's parameterized by an angle and it's just cos theta over two, sine theta over two, minus sine theta over two and cos theta over two. And these matrices fix Z equals I. So, so theta of course is, well, you can restrict theta to be between zero and two pi because you're quotienting by minus identity. And uh, this, this subgroup fixes uh, Z equals I and it sort of rotates around Z equals I. That's why H, that's why the upper half plane is a quotient of G by K. And uh, well, it, it will also be useful to parameterize the elements of G. So if small g will usually denote, will, will denote the some element of, of PSL2R and using the Ivasava decomposition, you can parameterize an element of G by three three numbers. Of course, it's a three, G is a three dimensional manifold and uh, you can parameter, let's parameterize it like this. So X and Y is a point in the upper half plane and there's a, there is a circle, so. It's, it's a it's a product of a translation, scaling, and a rotation. So, uh, to, as a smooth manifold, PSL two R is just the product of uh, the upper half plane and a circle, right? Circle corresponding to the maximal. So this this is just K. And finally, there is a Haar measure which is fixed up to overall rescaling. To be this. So this is this is the bi-invariant measure on PSO two R. Okay. Okay. So what is the surface now? Well, the surface X is just the is just a quotient of the upper half plane by some discrete subgroup of of PSL two R. So gamma 
gamma will be a subgroup of PSL2R such that it is discrete. So it has no accumulation points um, inside uh, PSL2R. And I'm also going to restrict to compact quotient. So H mod gamma will be compact, uh, which in particular implies that it's finite volume. Okay. That will be important for having a vacuum, a vacuum in the spectrum. Uh, but I'll also allow X to be an orbifold, which, which means the following in, in, in terms of gamma. So you can classify elements of PSL2R into hyperbolic, elliptic, and parabolic. Uh, the par well, parabolic elements lead to cusps at infinity, so that they would lead to non-compactness. So gamma has no parabolic elements. Uh, if you want X to be smooth without orbifold points, then gamma should only contain hyperbolic elements. But uh, I'm also going to allow gamma to contain elliptic elements. So elliptic elements are like are rotations by some angle, which is a, which needs to be in this case a two pi divided by some integer, uh, and it leads to orbifold points. So gamma can contain hyperbolic and elliptic elements. If there are no elliptic elements, it's a smooth uh, surface. If there are elliptic elements, it's an orbifold. Okay. And what we, what we want to do is that we want to solve the Laplace equation on the, in the upper half plane. So f, f, x, y is a function in the upper half plane, which, uh, which is invariant under gamma. So for all elements, small gamma will denote an element of this discrete subgroup. So f is invariant under it. And uh, this uh, Laplace operator in the upper half plane takes the following form. Sorry. Okay, so we are solving this equation with this, with this Laplace operator in the class of, in the space of smooth functions on the upper half plane, which satisfy this invariance condition. Okay. Now, what, so let me just describe some simple examples. Uh, the simplest example probably are the triangle groups. So to define a triangle group, uh, you start you start with the this is the upper half plane, and you draw three geodesics. Geodesics are just semicircles ending on the on the boundary of the upper half plane, and then there is a you, you set it up in such a way that there is a triangle. And, uh, uh, and then you can define gamma to be generated. So gamma is generated by rotations around the vertices, around uh, you know, A, B, C, this is A, this is B, and this is C. So the rotations which, which uh, map this picture into itself. So there are rotations by twice the angle uh, angle over here. And th this, this corresponds to a Fuchsian group if these angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, are pi divided by an integer. So you have some integers, n1, n2, n3. OK. And what, 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 uh, what is the surface? Well, the, the fundamental domain for gamma is a it is two copies of this triangle. So you sort of need to reflect this triangle once, and then you, you glue, glue the triangles together along the edges, and the vertices A, B, and C become orbifold points of degree N1, N2, and N3. Or of order N1, N2, and N3. Okay, and it, well, by the way, this only makes sense if one over N1. So it may only make sense when the area of the triangle is, is positive, which is the case when one over N1 plus one over N2 plus one over N3 is smaller than one. And then you can ask yourself, what is the smallest such triangle? And the smallest such triangle uh, in terms of the volume is the one corresponding to N1, N2, and N3 being two, three, seven. That's the smallest one. You're asking what is the sort of smallest area? 
what is the smallest, what is the set of n1, n2, n3 being the smallest area if they are subject to this condition? So that's 237. And the next smallest one is 238. So here is a here's a picture of the 238 case. You can see the blue and the white are the 238 triangles. The fundamental domain for gamma is just two triangles together, glued like that. And you have orbifold points here, here, and here. Okay. And uh, this is identified with that. Okay. Okay, so that's an orbifold. And then if you want to get a smooth manifold, you need to be, have genus at least two. And uh, the, you get a six dimensional moduli space of genus two. And the uh, most symmetric element of this moduli space is the Bosa surface, whose fundamental domain is, is over here. So this is the fundamental domain for Bosa surface. And it just corresponds to gluing together a certain number of these triangles. The number, I, I forgot how many there are, but uh, yeah. So it, it's a, it, these are still two, three, eight triangles. And you just glue the right number of them to, so, you, so you get a smooth surface of genus two. So for genus two, the most symmetric point is the Bosa surface. And for genus, which, which comes from gluing two, three, eight triangles. And for genus three, the most symmetric point is the Klein quartic, which comes from gluing two, three, seven triangles. So in some sense, the Klein quartic is even more symmetric than the Bosa surface because it comes from gluing small triangles. Okay, very good. So that's uh, that's the end of the of the setup, and uh, um, but, uh, I'll, I'll start describing the bootstrap uh, the bootstrap approach uh, unless there are some questions about the basic setup. Okay, so uh, I guess I guess uh, given any surface, it's probably trivial to to compute the spectrum relative to So you're saying the, the difficulty is that if you just like try to integrate numerically the spectrum, it's hard to understand the general picture of the spectrum as on, on the moduli space. Is this the... Um, is this yeah, the well, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not entirely trivial to, to go to arbitrary precision. Like you, you need to, you know, you need to put a Laplace equation on a, on a computer using, so it's, first of all, it's, it's non-rigorous right, because you're solving things numerically. And uh, you know, I, I don't think there is an efficient way to go to arbitrary precision. But even even without that, uh, it's you know this doesn't allow you to prove some general upper bound on, on say lambda one on the entire moduli space because you would you would need to explore the entire six dimensional moduli space or, or twelve dimensional moduli space of genus three if you wanted to have an upper bound on on lambda one. But can you give some intuition like which parts of the moduli space like for example, okay, some parts of the moduli space for this higher genus they correspond to some, you know, some handles becoming very long and so on. So I, I presume in those parts of the moduli space, it's unlikely that they're going to be uh, eigenvalues. Yeah. Well, the eigenvalues probably the gap is probably going to go to zero. So, so right. what 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 I will try to yeah, which part of the moduli space is the most interesting? Yeah, the most interesting one is is where where sort of the the yeah, where you you don't have any any long any long handle. So in some sense, is is the most the intuition is that the most symmetric point would, would, would maximize the gap, and that's indeed what seems to be happening, which is the for the Bosa and Okay. Thanks. But I guess the the most interesting part thing about this is that it's um it's a new method, you know, which maybe will will allow you to, to learn more general bounds on the on the spectrum. We, we are focusing on upper bound lambda one, but you know it's you still get infinite. You get infinitely many constraints on the spectrum, and you know, who knows what people can can learn from it. Okay. By the way, are, are you? It's Thibaut Damour speaking. The Chigger uh, inequality uh, will it play any role? This is. Uh, no. it, it, it talks about the first eigenvalue, no? Uh, I'm actually not not aware of the inequality, but it, it will not play any any role. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I probably have seen it at some point, but maybe we can maybe you can tell me at the end what's, what the Chigger inequality says. Uh, all right. So, what what is the setup for the bootstrap? Well, in the bootstrap, we basically need two things. We need to have some Hilbert space, 
which is a unit representation of some uh, nice sim semi-simple non-compact group, which in this case is going to be PSL2R. And we also need to have a notion of some kind of a product on the on the Hilbert space, uh, which is invariant under the action of the group. So we will have both of these two things here. So let me let me describe it. So first, we need some Hilbert space, which will which is a unit representation of PSL2R. The first you know the first guess for a Hilbert space, and this one doesn't turn turn out to be a representation of PSL2R. The first guess would be to just take the space of L2 integrable functions on the surface. Okay, but uh, of course this this is not a this is not a representation of PSL two R because so we have uh, th this uh, this F mod gamma is the same thing as double quotient of G where you quotient on the right by K and on the left by gamma, and by quotienting on both sides you've broken the whole symmetry, right? So well, so th this is this is not a representation of PSL two R of course, but uh, a way to make this into a representation of PSL two R is just to enlarge it a little bit or quite a lot. And consider the space of L2 functions on G mod gamma. So now G acts on G mod gamma by right multiplication, and that makes this V into a representation, unit representation of, of PSL2R. So this is the Hilbert space for the analog conformal field theory, so to, so to say. Of course, it's 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 much less complicated than Hilbert field of the conformal field theory, but uh, there is some pretty close analogy, nevertheless. Okay, so what, what are the elements of this Hilbert space? So F, uh, F is a, some element of this V. What is an F? Well, F is a function from the group to complex numbers such that it's invariant under left multiplication, right? So F for all gamma and gamma, F is invariant. And uh, if we define the following norm, so you can define a norm on this on V to be just the integral respect to the Haar measure on this group manifold. So I, I'm, I'm going to usually call this G mod gamma a group manifold. Okay, so it's some um, some three dimensional manifold which uh, is a sort of it, it's it's a, it's a principal K bundle over the over the surface. Okay, so the fibers are the circles which we have quotient about here, but now this G mod gamma is a three dimensional manifold. Okay, so the, the norm is just uh, the integral of the norm squared of f with respect to the Haar measure. And uh, well, and we take f to be such that, that this is finite. Okay, then there are elements of the L2 space. And we uh, this is a unit representation of G because uh, for each G tilde, you can act on f by right multiplication. And this right multiplication, of course, preserves the norm because uh, because of the, you have an invariant measure for the integration. So this makes V into a unitary representation of G. It's certainly not irreducible, but it's, it's nice and unitary. And 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 by the way, V includes V zero. So V0 was the space of functions on the surface. And uh, those are just the elements of V which are right invariant under, under K, right? So you can, you can decompose V according to how K acts. So K acts by multiplication still, and uh, you know, it's just a circle group. So you can decompose V into the, in terms of the charge with which SO2 acts. And uh, well, let's call it the space with charge N VN then V0 is just what I said before. So V0 is just functions, is just functions on the, on the surface. And more generally, Vn is the space of, uh, well, it's the space of L2 sections of, uh, you know, of the bundle, I guess they're called N, N0 forms. So it, it's, it's functions on the upper half plane. Uh, yeah, let's see. They're, so the uh, the elements of Vn are functions on the upper half plane such that they are not invariant under gamma, but they are covariant. They they transform they transform like this. Uh, C z plus d to the minus two n. 
Yeah, so if A, B, C, D is an element of the of gamma, then then f of z transforms like this. Okay, so somehow this this v combines functions on the surface together with a it's like a natural extension with it combines them with uh, with uh, with forms on the surface, some sections of a, of a bundle of uh, things that transform like forms. And the, the virtue of this of this is that uh, while PSL two R doesn't act on v zero, it acts on the whole thing. Right? It, uh, it it can it it can transform. If you act with raising and lowering operators in P, in PSL two R, you can move between the different VNs. Okay, now, now what we are going to do is that we are going to decompose V into irreducible representation of PSL2R and see that they correspond to uh, various automorphic forms, including you know, these mass forms, which are just the Laplace eigenfunctions, but also there will be holomorphic forms uh, inside V. But uh, maybe let me stop now to see if there are any questions about what I've said so far. Again, yeah, I mean, yeah, if, if you don't understand something, you should, uh, you should really. Us because this is super crucial. So, like the basic idea is that we want you know, the, the most important thing is that G acts on V by you know, and it, it it can move you between the different VNs. So you have generators, the usual generators L zero and L plus or minus one. L zero is just the generator of rotation, so it it uh, measures the charge. L zero F just tells you what is the what is, the, what is this integer m? And l plus and minus, they, they take functions and they, well, and they, they increase or decrease the value of m. There, there are just some differential operators on this group manifold. All of these l plus or minus and l0. Okay, so if there are no questions, let me proceed with uh, decomposing V into irreducible representations of ESL two R. So we want to we want to decompose V as a direct sum of unitary irreducible representations of ESL two R. These have been classified a long time ago, and there is a nice complete list. One, the first one is the trivial representation. The next one is the principal series, which I'm going to combine with another one called the complementary series. For our purposes, they'll be, they'll be looking identical, complementary series. And finally, there is the discrete series. And it's conjugate. So the, the trivial representation and principal series are real representations. And the discrete series is, is complex and is dual is the conjugate. So that's that's why these they come in, in pairs. Okay, and now for each of these three points, one, two, and three, uh, they correspond to some uh, object on the surface. I want to explain what these objects on the surface are, and we'll see that they exactly correspond to these so-called automorphic forms. And uh, well, the, these Laplace eigenfunctions and uh, holomorphic modular forms in the case of a discrete series. I mean, of course, all, all this is very standard. I'm just reviewing standard material, and the the new part is coming is coming right after that. All right, so let's start with the trivial representation, just one-dimensional trivial representation of PSL two R. Well, it corresponds to constant functions. So it's constant functions on, on G mod gamma, in this three-dimensional three manifold, which is the same thing as constant functions on the surface. And, uh, this representation appears exactly once in inside V, and that's you know that's because uh, there is just a one-dimensional space of constant functions, and the constant functions appear uh, because the well, first of all, 
G acts uh, transitively on this G mod gamma, so only constant functions can appear, and the volume is finite, so any constant function is L2 normalizable. Okay. So there is a basically there is only one vacuum in this Hilbert space it appears exactly once, and that's consequence of the of finiteness of the volume of the of the manifold. Okay. Now the principal and complementary series. These uh, these representations are labeled by a single parameter, and I'm going to denote them collectively as p lambda or p standing for principal. And I'm not going to make a distinction between principal and complementary series. Uh, well, the, they just this principal and complementary just correspond to different values of lambda. So for principal, lambda is greater than or equal to one quarter, and for complementary. Lambda is between zero and one quarter. Okay. And these, these are some infinite dimensional representations uh, which, which, have, which have exactly one vector. So there, there's a basis for these representations, uh, which have a, which is one, one vector of each charge under, under rotations, right? So we have L zero VN is N times VN and L, plus or minus one acting on Vn is some, some square root of something that's not too important uh, times Vn minus plus one. So L plus or minus one uh, move you between these two things, be, between different ends as I already said many times. But now let's imagine that we have a we have such a representation. Oh, sorry, uh, I should say that uh, lambda, lambda enters in here. Okay, so it, it tells you ex well, lambda, lambda is the Casimir. So the, the quadratic Casimir is lambda. It uh, it enters inside this uh, this expression, and it's going to be convenient to write it as delta times one minus delta. Okay, so that principal series corresponds to delta being one half plus i t, and complementary is uh, delta being between zero and one half. Okay. Now, you see that there is a vector inside the, the principal series, which has a zero charge under, under the rotations, which means it's just a function on the surface, right? If, if something has zero charge on the rotation, it doesn't depend on the circle direction of this group manifold. So it's literally just a function on the surface. So, so let, let's, take, let's take V0 inside P lambda, which is embedded inside our Hilbert space, okay? So this V0 is the same thing as having a function on the surface, a function on the upper half plane, which is G invariant, but it also needs to be an angular function of the Casimir right? because it's, it's inside an irreducible representation. So that means that, uh, uh, well, the, uh, well, you can work out what the Casimir is in terms of differential operator on the surface and it's just the Laplace operator. Okay. so. So this f is just an eigenfunction of the Laplace operator with eigenvalue lambda, where lambda is this parameter of the principal series. And the same thing for the complementary series, just in a, in a different range of lambda. So in, in other words, the task of, well, first of all, I should say that it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So not just that if you have a principal series, you'll find an eigenfunction of the Laplace operator, but every eigenfunction of the Laplace operator arises from the principal series in this way. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between direct summons inside L and inside V, which are isomorphic to principal series, and eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Yeah. In, in, other, in other words, the, the, the task of decomposing V into irreducibles uh, contains a subtask, which is which is the same thing as that as finding the spectrum of the Laplacian. They are literally like, like almost equivalent problem. Well, why are, why are they not equivalent? They are not equivalent because there is also discrete series, and discrete series uh, corresponds to holomorphic modular forms on the surface. Right, so discrete series is like, like principal, but there's a well, delta is now a positive integer, and it's a lowest weight representation. The lowest weight uh, is denoted, can be denoted V delta, and it corresponds to, to some function, which now transforms with a non-trivial factor. So it's, well, I, I already 
So it, it transforms like a modular form under gamma of weight two n, or sorry, two delta. But but now this is a it's a lowest weight representation. So L L one annihilates V delta. This is like the primary operator of the conform field theory. And uh, well, this means that this turns out to be equivalent to the statement that F is holomorphic. In other words, F is a holomorphic modular form corresponding to for, for the group gamma. Okay. And uh, the conjugate conjugate uh, representation for the discrete series is just the highest weight representation. So there is an there's a vector of weight minus delta, which is the highest weight. And this one this one corresponds to something anti-holomorphic, and it is just the conjugate of f. Right. So these things just come in pairs. F and f bar, they are both uh, covariant with this factor, or maybe with a z bar for the f bar. And f is holomorphic, f bar is anti-holomorphic. So to, to summarize, decomposing V into irreducibles look like this. There is a trivial representation. Then there is a sum over Laplace eigen, eigenvalues or Laplace eigenfunctions on the, this Laplace operator on a surface. So that would mean to note there's a sum over some index I, where lambda I are the eigenvalues, and it's some of the principal series with the label. And finally, then there's, there's a sum over discrete series where the, these uh, discrete series summons correspond to linearly independent modular forms of, uh, of weight 2i. Okay. And uh, one nice thing is that the, the degeneracy of a given discrete series can be computed from topology. So the riemann rock theorem tells you that, tells you the number of these independent uh, bi's so the, the number of linear independent discrete series of dimension delta i is given by some is given by, by this formula. G is the genus of the surface. And then there is a sum over the orbifold points and their orders. And there is a small correction at delta equals one. So these are weights to module forms. Right, in, in particular for delta equals one, one, which are the holomorphic one forms, they their the number of their number of linear independent one forms is just the genus. Sorry. Okay. Okay, I'm going a little slow. But okay, uh, that, that's a summary the, of the of this uh, talk so far. This this formula. That's basically all you all you need to remember. Are there any questions about that? Uh, I have a question. Uh, so since the, the, the inner product here is different from the, the radio quantization inner product in one dimensional CFT, uh, is there uh, some, um, uh, some, some analog of unitarity bound on delta or lambda? Um, so the... the, the I mean, there is a unitary bound, but I, I, I described it, right? So the discrete series is unitary when delta is a positive integer. Mm -hmm. and the principal series and a complementary series are unitary when delta oh, is, in, okay. is in this range. Okay, okay. so these, these, this is the complete list of unitary representations of PSL2. The, the representations which, are, which look most like the representations we are used from CFT, like they are the lowest weight, so they're like discrete series. But in CFTs, delta is, is a continuous parameter, which is because we don't really do PSL2R, but we are dealing with the universal cover of PSL2R. But in this case, the, the circle direction is not decompactified, it's compact. So delta must be an integer or a discrete series. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Okay, I think I should maybe speak up a little bit. Okay, so uh, now let's define a core. Correlation functions. So, correlation function is some 
it's just the projection from V to, to the trivial representation. And the way to do it, if you have some element of the vector space, uh, some function on the, on the group manifold, it's just the integral over the group manifold with respect to the Haar measure of Fg, right? So this is, this is clearly a G invariant uh, map from, the, from V to the trivial representation. Um, and uh, we, we can think of it as a correlator in the CFT. Um, okay, so if, if you, you know, if, if you feed into it a constant function, you get some non-zero value, but if you feed into an element of an irreducible representation, which is not, uh, which is not the trivial representation, you just get zero. So the one-point functions of operators vanish unless the operator is identity, as usual. Okay, but now, finally, we can talk about the OPE. So the OPE is going to be the thing which will constrain the spectrum. Right, right, right now, I didn't really describe any constraint on the spectrum, but uh, the idea is that there is a G invariant product on V or on the set of smooth vectors in V, uh, which will which imposes very strong constraints on the possible spectra that can appear in this decomposition. Right, so we want to what we want is to have a some G invariant map, which is like a bilinear map from V times V to to V, which is G invariant. And there is essentially a unique way to do that. And if you, that's just to send the two functions to the pointwise product of two functions. So F1, F2 are functions on the group manifold, G mod gamma. And if you take their pointwise product, you get a nice product. Uh, well, you still get an, well, you, you get something which is G invariant clearly. It's bilinear and it's got all the properties that, that you want. But, but there's a sm sm small subtlety, which is that uh, this only works for smooth vectors. So the, you know, if, if you take two general L2 functions, their product may not be L2. But if the functions were smooth, then uh, their, their product is also smooth and it's also L2 normalizable because the, the surface is compact. Okay, so it's a sort of a product defined on a restriction on V. Okay, and now the point is that, uh, well, for PSL2R, there are only finitely many trilinear invariant maps. In other words, word to say it is that if, if you con they con consider G invariant maps from product of two representations to a third representation, there is there's only finitely many finite dimensional space of such G invariant maps. In fact, uh, it's usually one dimensional in the case that I'll look at is one dimensional, uh, which means that, well, let's let's take two functions and let's imagine that F1 is inside Ri and F2 is inside Rj, inside V. Okay, so- Why, are you, why are you writing Ry infinity? Because I thought that each oh. Ry only consists of infinitely differentiable functions. Uh, no, that's not quite true. So K finite vectors inside Ri, Consists of uh, of an infinite uh, of, of ah smooth okay R I is infinite dimensional you are not allowed to take infinite, infinite dimensional okay, yeah. okay. So, fine, fine, fine. okay sorry sorry about that yeah yeah but it's it's okay yeah I, I'm I'm going to suppress the infinity from now on you just imagine that everything is is smooth uh, okay and now we can just decompose this using the direct sum decomposition from earlier so it's some infinite sum over the irreps uh, appearing earlier. Uh, with some structure constants. So these C12i are structure constants. They are, they're labeled by, you know, no, so I should maybe write this as a ij, capital I. And because of this gene variance, the dependence of the F tilde on F1 and F2 is completely fixed by the conformal symmetry, by the, the PSL2R. Uh, if so, if, if F1 ranges over Ri and F2 ranges over Rj, then this F tilde is completely fixed by invariance. And the only thing which is not fixed is this, uh, is this number. So this would be the case if uh, the space of such maps is one dimensional, which will be the case for us now, but in general, it could be some finite dimensional space. Okay, now to describe, to describe these uh, maps, let me, let, me, let me restrict to the discrete series. So, let, 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 let me define some coherent states, which will look like local operators. Coherent states for the discrete series. So let f, well, let fi 
be the lowest weight vector in this discrete series representation, which is in, which is in, thought of as a, as a subspace of V. And what we can do is that now we can define something which looks very much like a local operator. So we can introduce an auxiliary parameter W, which is basically one dimensional complexified space time. And you can just act with this group element, just, just the exponentiated translation, translation on, the low, on the lowest weight. Okay, so this is exactly like a lo local operator in the 1D CFT. This is the local operator at the origin, and we act with a translation to get the local operator somewhere, uh, somewhere else at some value w. And this is inside v if uh, w is in the unit disk. You know, as usual, a local operator corresponds to a normalizable state if the operator is, in, is inserted inside the, inside the unit sphere. And uh, similarly, you can define OI bar, which will be a similar translate of the highest weight. So let me just write it first. Right, so F was a, some holomorphic modular form. F bar is its, is its conjugate, so it's anti-holomorphic modular form. And it's an element of a, of a high surge representation. And now you can act with this uh, exponential of L1 now to get a local operator corresponding to the conjugate discrete series. And this is inside V if now W is outside of the unit circle. So unit, unit, yeah, unit disk. And which means that the O's and O bars will not touch each other. So all the W's will be inside the unit disk, all the W, uh, all the O bars will be outside of the unit disk. And the point is that now the conformal generators act on these O's in the same way as we are used to from CF from, from usual CFT literature. So for example, L minus one acts as a derivative on both an O and O bar. So the action on O bar is the same as the action on O. The action of L zero is uh, this W, dW plus D delta I, O bar, O W. And the action of L one is again the standard W squared dW and two delta i w acting on o w okay so now we can just use gene variants uh, to to constrain everything okay now one can also describe the the ope so uh, suppose we take an op of two discrete series representations now, it turns out that the only thing that this can map into is a discrete series representation. So it's also lowest weight, and there's a lower bound on delta three, which is delta one plus delta two. And, you know, there's a, there's a corresponding OPE, OI W1. So OI W1 is some function on the group manifold, OJW2 is another function of the group manifold. The product means that we are taking pointwise product of those two functions in the group manifold. And the claim is that now this can be expanded using uh, you know, these o OIs for some other discrete series using structure constants. So K runs over all the discrete series such that delta K is greater than or equal to delta I plus delta J. So the OP is non-singular you know, because the thing that says here is delta K minus delta I minus delta J. This, this, this holomorphic OP is non-singular, and there is, you know, there's the contribution of the of the lowest weight representation uh, com coming from delta K. Sorry, Delamel. Uh, yep. uh, these FIs are, are functions of uh, uh, of which manifold? Of, uh, PSL, yeah. PSL. So every everything everything is a function on G mod gamma. It's a three-dimensional manifold. Yes, but uh, when you are doing this uh, this uh, exponential of uh, W L minus one, uh, you wrote uh, uh, yes. This F, these Fs and uh, F I bars, uh, mm -hmm. they are they are on the specific point. Of the... uh, so F I is some specific function on G mod gamma, which is basically mm -hmm. the holomorphic modular form with some extra prefactor. But forget sure. about the prefactor. And now you act with this group element, and this group element just sort of rotates the function of the group manifold. So you you can no longer once you've acted with this group element, you can no longer sort of factor out the theta dependence. 
So you can no longer think of this as a, as a function on the surface in any sense for general W, but it's still a function on the group manifold the G, on the G mod gamma. Okay, thank you. And now I'm taking two of them, multiplying them together and expanding in a complete, you know, using the direct sum decomposition. And the claim is that only lowest weight things can appear thanks to representation theory. If you do the same thing for, well, we, now we need to do the same thing for uh, lowest weight times highest weight, then this can map into the trivial representation and the principal series. And this is how principal series is going to appear uh, for us. Uh, maybe, maybe, okay, let, let me, so that, that's, that's all I wanna say about this. Now you, you can you can just, uh, you can compute uh, correlation functions, right? So you can compute the two point function, two point function of, uh, Two lowest weights is zero because there is no singlet appearing in the op of two lowest weights but you can compute a correlator of oi oj oj bar which now constantly is a singlet and this thanks to sl2r invariance needs to look like w1 minus w2 to the power two delta i and similarly for the three-point function Well, three-point function of lowest weight, lowest weight, and highest weight will look like the usual three-point function with the OP coefficient being just this, you know, I've, I've defined the CIJ case here. And that's, that's the same as the three-point function. And there's the usual triple product of uh, you know, W1 minus W2, W1 minus W3 to some powers, W, uh, W2 minus W3. Okay, I'm... So my time is almost up, but I'm almost done. So the, the, the thing that we are going to use to constrain the spectrum is the four-point function, as usual in the bootstrap. So the, and the specifically four-point function that I'm going to focus on is of the following form. We'll take, well, let me first write it down. So it will be a four point function of O, O, O bar, O bar at four different points. Okay, so now what, what's going on? So now we, we can use the product to take a product of O, I, O, J and O, K bar, O, L bar. So let, let, yeah. we, we can take this, these products. And that means that in this sort of OPE channel, we're only going to get a contribution from the lowest weight representation. So only sort of things fixed by topology. Like the, the number of these things is fixed by the riemann roch theorem and it's much it's under control. But we can also take the product in a different way. We can take a product of OJ, OK bar. And in that channel, we are going to find the identity and the principal series. So we are going to find uh, things which depend on the spectrum of the Laplacian. And in this way, we are going to constrain the spectrum of the Laplacian. So in the S channel, we have something which is kind of known. And in the T channel, we have the thing that we want, we have the object that we want to constrain. Known, but not fully known because the sub coefficients, yeah. I guess, they're known. Exactly. So, I mean, if you, yeah, the OP coefficient depend on the point in the moduli space, for example. If you if you knew all the holomorphic OP coefficients, then you would know all the, the entire Laplacian spectrum thanks to this bootstrap equation, right? You could just expand this correlator in the S channel. And if you know all the structure constants for the modular forms, you would also, you would just expand it in the, in the, in the cross channel and recover the entire Laplacian spectrum. So one thing which has not uh, really appeared so far are the conformal blocks. Are they going yeah, to- Yeah, they are about to appear. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little slow. So let's, let's assume that all of the deltas of these delta of these OI, OJ, OK, and OL are the same and let's just call it delta. Now, this correlator, this four-point function, let me first write it in a way which manifests the symmetry. It's really a function of, of a cross ratio of the four points. So chi is the cross ratio, the only cross ratio that we all know and love. And uh, well, what I was saying before implies that G of chi 
can be expanded in two different ways. In the in the S channel, we have a sum over discrete series in such a way that delta M is greater than two delta. And there are structure constants C, I, J, M times C, K, L, M, and this is bar, times a known function. So this function is fixed by the conformal symmetry and it's just the 1D block. So this G, this G delta of chi is, is a known function, which is just some 2F1. So chi to the delta, 2F1, delta, delta, 2 delta, chi. Okay, so that's in the S channel and you're summing over holomorphic things. And in the, in the other channel, the expansion looks as follows. So there's the usual prefactor that translates us between S and T channel. There's a contribution of identity and then, which is just one. And then there is a sum over the Laplace spectrum of some other structure constants. These are the structure constants corresponding to D times D bar into principal series states. So these, these things depend on, you know, on a specific surface. And it's E, let's call them C tilde. And the, the contribution comes from a known function again, a function fixed by conformal symmetry, which is just the T channel conformal partial wave. So this H, H of lambda chi is another 2F1. It's a 2F1 delta tilde, one minus delta tilde one chi over chi minus one okay so it's a it's a sum over the t channel conformal block and its shadow and the reason you need that is that uh, well sorry i should say delta bar is a so lambda is the same thing as delta tilde times one minus delta tilde and uh, well one one way to see that uh, that is the is the partial wave which appears in the t channel is that g g chi can be expanded around chi equals zero and it's it's a it's a holomorphic function with a nice holomorphic tail series around chi equals zero and both an s and t channel manifest this so in particular the t channel uh, t channel blocks that appear here are must be holomorphic around chi equals zero around the s channel and uh, that's why you need to take a combination of a uh, block and its shadow such that uh, the thing is holomorphic around chi equals zero so there, there isn't the, the logarithm drops out in that case i mean okay so now i'm I, I'm, I'm about to to finish with the with the punchline. Well, maybe next or maybe i just need three or four more minutes that's okay uh so let's just take this these two formulas and equate them to each other because they are they are the same thing in some range of chi and in particular they are the same in a power series exp expansion around chi equals zero so let's just take the equation expand the bootstrap equation so this is to so the mathematician this is something that we would call the bootstrap equation equation around chi equals zero. Now the, the, the terms in the power series expansion around chi equals zero would correspond to just inserting some k finite vectors in here. Right? Because all these things are some exponentials with w appearing in the exponential. So if you expand around chi equals zero is the same thing as sort of expanding the exponential to some finite order and taking that uh, descendant. So expanding to some finite order in chi I around chi equals zero is like inserting a k finite vector into each of these slots. So in particular, it's it's a perfectly well defined uh, thing that you can take a four point function of that and you can expand it in two different channels. So this is slightly different from the usual bootstrap where we cannot expand the p channel expansion on chi equals zero. But if you if you do that, well, what do you get? So for example, let's expand to to this order, two delta plus three. So everything starts at two delta. So the third order is two delta plus three. Then you find an equation which only contains contributions from the principal series. Okay, it's, it's a, it's a, there's a way to take linear combination such that the discrete series drops out and you find this equation. So remember delta is the external 
dimension, which is the weight of the modular form that we are using. And there is some cubic polynomial of lambda, which takes this form. Uh, okay, now I'm just setting i, j, k, and l to be equal to each other, to be the same operator. And this is the equation you get. So it's a sum over the structure constant squared times some cubic polynomial of lambda, which is parameterized by delta. And now let's let's plot this uh, let's plot this polynomial. It looks like this. It has a zero at the origin at lambda equals i, so identity doesn't contribute. And there is some negative region over here. Right, so what this equation tells us, this equation can only be satisfied if there is at least one Laplace eigenvalue in this range. Because everything, otherwise you will get a sum of positive terms. In particular, you get an upper bound on the first Laplace eigenvalue, which is this. So lambda one must be smaller than or equal to this lambda gap, which is this number. Well, you can you can figure it out. So say so. Let, let's let's say delta equal to six. Delta equal to six is the lowest delta, which is always present on all hyperbolic surfaces. In particular, it is the gap in a discrete spectrum, discrete series spectrum for uh, for the two three seven two three eight triangles. So let's just use delta equal six because and then we get universal bound on all hyperbolic surfaces. Then you can compute this this root, and the root is just uh, equal to this value, it's 45.507, blah, blah, blah. And you can then, comp well, then let's compare it to the smallest, uh, to the smallest surface, which is just the 237 triangle surface, 237 hyperbolic orbifold, for which lambda one is 44.888335. So it's, it's pretty close. It's not quite there, but that, that's just because we have we only expanded to some finite to, to the third order. And you can expand to any order you want, and then you can set up a systematic linear or semi-definite program. We did this using SDPB, thanks to David uh, Simons Duffin and Walter Laundry. And what you get when you when we expand to like order two delta plus uh, I think like 35 or so, we get an upper bound using this logic. Which is lambda one uh, smaller than or equal to forty four point eight 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 three five three seven. So to the to the or to the number of decimal places to which we solve this Laplace equation on the two three seven triangle numerically, we get a perfect agreement. Okay, so that's that's for that's when we set i j k l to be the same and delta equals six. And finally. How do we get a bound on the genus two and arbitrary genus moduli space? So the way to fix genus, you know, is to is to use the delta equals one one forms. So the the oi, oj, ok, and ol, they will correspond to the delta equals one one forms with i, j, k, and l ranging from one to g. Okay, so we are considering this equation. Uh, coming from expanding this, this object. Uh, well, we, we are considering the set of equations where i, j, k, and l range for all from one to g over all the linear homomorphic one forms on the surface. And in this way, we get a universal bound on the, on the entire genus G moduli space. Uh, the only difference is that instead of this positivity, we are imposing some positive semi definiteness of matrices, which is, it, it's very standard in the conform bootstrap literature. Um, and what, what you get is, this so for, for genus two, our bound is a lambda one, it's 3.838977, which is a pre previous bound. Was this lambda one equal to four due to Yang and Yao? Yang Yao, and the Bosa surface, which is the most symmetric surface of genus two, has lambda one. Uh, uh, 3.838873. We did it for any genus, but uh, so far the agreement is the best at genus three, where our bound at genus three, so using sort of three different external operators, 
is uh, lambda one less than or equal to 2.6785, where the previous best known bound is actually was published last year, 2020, uh, where Ross showed that uh, lambda one is uh, bounded by 2.7085. So it's pretty close to our bound. But you can compare it to an actual surface, the most symmetric surface in the genus to moduli space, which is just the, which is the coin quartic, and whose lambda one is 2.67, and we, we don't know the following decimal places. So again, to this to this uh, order, our bound agrees with the most symmetric point in the moduli space. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, I should also say that in the cases when it's when it's the bound is saturated, you can extract not just the first eigenvalue but also well, in principle, all the eigenvalues. Um, right. If the bound is exactly saturated, this linear functional must uh, vanish on the entire spectrum. So you get this structure of double zeros. Now, these, these kinds of functional are closely related to the magic functions. Uh, well, it, closely. They're in spirit the same thing that uh, the magic functions from the solution of sphere packing problem. Where this is just lambda one, this is lambda two and lambda three, and we we compared it, you know, for the for the triangle, we extracted in this way the first five eigenvalues, and they'll agree to like at least three decimal places with the with the solution numerical solution of class equation. So that's that's it, and uh, you know there are some natural future directions like generalizing to non compact uh, or non compact manifolds where there is a continuous spectrum from the Eisenstein series, generalizing to higher dimensional hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, think about arithmetic surfaces, in which case there is an enhanced symmetry due to the Hecke operators. Uh, but, but, yeah, I think maybe most importantly, we should uh, think about how you know what what this can teach us about actual CFDs. Like what I explained to you is that for each hyperbolic, well, there is a natural bootstrap problem, which is a small deformation of the standard conformal bootstrap in one of these CFDs, and it has the property that every hyperbolic manifold manifestly satisfies all the all the equations uh, in this modified bootstrap problem so i think the most important challenge is to figure out if there is a, a natural constructions of cfts along these lines or some different similar lines such that this construction will automatically output objects which manifestly satisfy all the standard bootstrap equations but that's uh, of course very ambitious and uh, maybe a long-term goal of this research program so thank you and sorry for running over time Thanks a lot, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. We, we, we do have time for questions in spite of being over time. So please go ahead, guys and girls. Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Daniel, uh, what's uh, how the computation uh, time and space uh, grows with the number of digits that you want to compute? Oh, uh, so like for 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 another for another to compute another digit, how much more uh, uh, well, would you need to run uh, your, your program? Um, so I, I think basically what happens is that uh, first, uh, well, it, the, the 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 bound converges very quickly. So at first, it's some some kind of po polynomial approach, but as soon as the bound gets to the vicinity of the correct answer, it converges exponentially fast, mm -hmm. essentially. But actually, I, I forgot to say this, but it seems like our bounds are converging to a number which is strictly above the actual the actual value. So for example, oh, thank for you. The that was actually my second question. Like yeah, yeah. For, for, like, the, for the for yeah, the I, I should have mm -hmm. I should have I should have emphasized it. So the, we believe that these digits over here, the eight three eight eight nine seven seven, they have all converged. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are strictly, this is strictly above the actual value for both, which, which is known to have a good precision. Mm -hmm. But of course, there is no, there is no contradiction there. I mean, it's, the yeah. bound is satisfied and we are only using a single correlator. So the idea is that you could, you could use as many correlators as you want, maybe throw in, uh, you know, throw in some holomorphic two forms as external operators, try various things. And probably if you, if you try the right thing, you'll be able to decrease these digits using the bootstrap as well. But you, you're gonna to have to do something slightly more complicated than what, what we did. I see. And is the computation faster than a finite element method to get the same number of digits? Uh, 
uh, well, using our using our expertise in the bootstrap, it was faster. But we are not we are not experts at uh, you know, we we haven't really tried to optimize our population Laplace eigenvalue. So mm -hmm. yeah, these these digits you can get you know you can get in a couple of minutes, I think, on a cluster. Or maybe, maybe. So yeah, I, I did the I did the computation on my laptop, and it took me maybe uh, probably a day at most to to get all of these digits. Probably much less. Yeah, I don't exactly remember. Thanks. Uh, I have a question. So so for um, so since you use the data equals one uh, operator to produce the. Uh, the, the the bound lambda one less than three point eight blah blah. So, uh, so I, I want to ask, uh, uh, given an arbitrary uh, subgroup gamma, does this delta equals one operator always exist? A good question. Yeah, it, it doesn't always exist, but it uh, it always exists uh, when it's uh, when the manifold has at least genus one. So there, you know there's a there's a formula for the number of these of these delta equals one forms, mm -hmm. and it's exactly to equal to the genus. So if the genus is zero, they don't exist. If the genus is one or greater, they always exist. Okay. So they're, they're numbers equal to the genus. So that, that's, that's, how it, that's how we were able to fix the genus in our problem. But that's, that's like the only way that we are fixing the genus. Mm -hmm. It allows us to explore the end, to, to put a general bound on the entire genus, fixed genus moduli space. Maybe some questions from mathematicians. Yeah, I have a question, Maxim. Yeah. Are you a mathematician? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm Maxim. Ah, Maxim, yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 With this picture of this ma magic function when lambda 2 lambda, does it mean that lambda 2 lambda 3 will be degenerate? Kind of twice it um, appears on the are, 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 you, are you asking, are you asking why, why there's a double zero as opposed to a single yeah, zero? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's not related to degeneracy. It's just related to the to the positivity properties that we are imposing. So I we see. are. I, I didn't I didn't exp, I didn't explain the linear programming or semi different programming yeah. setup that we use. But basically, what what we are do you, we we take this equation, we expand it to some finite order. So we get uh, some kind of uh, set of polynomials of lambda, which uh, need to sum to a positive thing when you sum them over the spectrum. No. And now we want to take a, such a linear combination, which is positive above lambda gap. I see. Okay. If it's positive above lambda gap and there is a saturating solution with that lambda gap, then the only way this is consistent is if the function will actually vanish, if the polynomial actually vanishes at all of these points. So yeah, it needs to vanish and it's positive, it's non-negative. So it needs to have a order zero, zero of order, which is even, right? It, it cannot cross below. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. Am I am I making myself clear or no, yeah, yeah, but does it mean that lambda two is appears twice in the spectrum? Yeah. Um, well, it's not, it's not, it's not really, it's not related to that. I see, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. for, for the, so it, it is true that, for example, for these symmetric surfaces like Bosa and Klein, there's a degeneracy in the spectrum because these surfaces have some automorphism group and lambdas come in irreducible representations of this automorphism group, which can be more than one dimensional. So there is a degeneracy, but this degeneracy cannot be directly seen by staring at this function. This double, order of double zero is not related to that. Okay, thanks. So, sorry, could I, could I ask a question? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah thanks for the talk. So, yeah, I just uh, have been thinking, uh, you know, along similar lines about the relation between mass forms and, you know, conform bootstrap problems. So, uh, yeah, first I just wanted to clarify your setup. So uh, it, it seems to me that, you know, like uh, for automorphic forms, uh, I mean, th there are papers of Reznikov, right, and Bernstein. Uh, so I know you probably know about this, right? So there's this uh, setup is, uh, which is called strong Gilfan formation, right? So like within lattice of subgroups of some group, uh, mm -hmm. you have like a diamond and uh, along each uh, edge, you have sort of strong Gilfan property, right? And then when you sort of, um, uh, you know, you take automorphic representation, then you, Sort of go along these edges, and you can go in, in two ways. And he produces rank in cellular type identity, which is sort of uh, our bootstrap equation, right? So it seems to me that it's like uh, the same here, right? I mean, am I correct? Or mm. um, so I, I'm not familiar with this with the work that you're mentioning. But, uh... ah, okay, so you are not. Ah, okay, 
Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I'm not terminal, but uh, I mean, because does, does it involve like the same? Does, 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 it, does it involve? Does it involve the? Yeah, is it in the context of arbitrary gamma or is it arithmetic gamma or? No, no, it's of course arbitrary, right? I mean, that's uh, arbitrary gamma and. Right? Yeah. yeah, there are papers of like Bernstein and uh, Resnikov from like 15 years ago, uh, which discusses okay. uh, sort of consistent conditions. The only thing which they did not do is, of course, numeric. I mean, uh, right? Mm. So and, right, and, that's okay. And, that's that uh, well, that on, on, on one hand makes me a bit sad that we no, no, but, but it's, it's maybe not exactly what uh, what you yeah. have because uh, what they did. I mean, what I remember exactly is that uh, uh, they do like external uh, mass forms, right? Okay. So, uh, yeah, and, and they sort of mentioned that that you can do external discrete series, and uh, but it's just I mean it's a bit I mean they didn't pass it to do it maybe right now yeah. What, what was the reason? But uh, so maybe it's not uh, precisely. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll but it's so. very close. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll yeah, but I think I think it have only triple products. This is, this is my memory. No, no, no. It it has quadruple products. I mean, there quadruple is a paper of quadruple asking. products. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's a paper of uh, Resnikov alone. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take a look. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, maybe so. Uh, it's just a comment, and then yeah, I had uh, also a question. So. Yeah, so, uh, so is it correct that, I mean, with this, you sort of uh, put uh, sort of systematics into Bonifacio numerics, right? I mean, uh, like in your work, or is there more to it? Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's just making what he, well, so in, in his work, there is, there is no, he, he didn't realize that there is this PSL2R symmetry. Yeah. So he, was, he was just working with functions on the, on the surface. And you know, using sort of the algebra of covariant derivatives and the fact that the manifold is hyperbolic, yeah, sure, sure, sure. You, you know, you know what is the what is sort of the contraction of two covariant derivatives? What is the commutator? So basically, it's our main contribution is realizing that in his setup uh, there is a conformal symmetry. Oh, okay. we, we, yeah, there there is this PSL to our symmetry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And, I mean, we, yeah, we, and, we, and, we, and uh, so do, you don't uh, kind of produce uh, kind of interesting new analytical functionals. Uh, you know, like related to L functions of the surfaces and so on. Do you, or I mean? Well, I think the, these surfaces only have L functions when they have cusps, right? Uh, otherwise you can't really talk about L function, at least. I mean, that's, okay. that's yeah, it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, well, we, yeah, yeah we, we, we have not, we, we haven't constructed analytic functions for, for these. I mean, as, as I said, it looks like uh, the bounds are very close, but they're not exactly saturated. Sure, so sure. The, the, the optimal functional, does not really know about the surface itself. It only knows to, about it within some good approximation, mm -hmm. but not exactly. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. But I, I'm sorry, Misha, so you knew about this, but you didn't do it. Yeah, because I think it was to trick, I mean, well, somehow, that's, you know. that's shame on you. I, I saw that, uh, you know, without uh, new functionals. With, uh, yeah, most like, of us didn't know about this, so we didn't do it. If you knew about this, but didn't do it, then it's, it's no, no, pretty, but I thought uh, that, you know, without, oh, sorry, without new, like, analytical functionals, it's not so interesting, right? But if you can do numerics, of course, that's... No, but actually, I have a question, Daniel. So, uh, these people who proved bounds, uh, Yao and uh, this uh, person in 2020, I forgot the name is. Uh, Ross, Ross. You know, or Ross. Ross. So how did they do it? Did they use some sort of similar techniques or did they use completely different? Uh, as, as far as I can tell, they used uh, completely different techniques. Like they, for example, Yang Yao, they uh, they take the surface and they, they imagine they have some, uh, uh, they have some holomorphic map to the sphere. So this, uh, this map always exists. And then uh, you know they integrate some kind of a some kind of a functional of that of that map over the over the surface, and you know do, do some integration by parts, things like that. I think, and uh, it, it allows them to put bounds on the Laplace eigenvalue. Basically, the Laplace eigenvalue comes from uh, acting with some acting with the Laplace equation, and you know you, you, using the fact that the absolute value of the gradient is positive. So th think things like that uh, are used in the in the Yang Yao proof, but it's not yeah it it yeah that that bound is not you know precise enough to be to be saturated hmm. well i think the young young yell bound is saturated uh, at genus 2 by a different metric so so, so the young yell bound doesn't use uh, hyperbolicity it's a, it's a general upper bound uh, 
on the first lambda one for a general Riemannian metric. Uh, it's a bound in terms of the area of the surface. And uh, with some, you know, like you, you can, of course, you, you, you don't have any general upper bound because you can make the surface arbitrarily small and then the, the first lambda one goes to goes to infinity but uh, if you normalize every if you normalize the area then there is an upper bound yeah, well, as, as far as i can tell their technique was is very different any other questions by the way just to yeah, then, yeah the, yes so the 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 Chiger, uh, and boozer inequalities they give both a lower i i was checking and other bounds for lambda one, which uses the the minimal length of a geodesic cutting yeah. the surface in two. Okay. Yeah, I I, I, rem I remember. You remember? Uh, okay. So yeah, it's probably rough compared to what you do. Yeah, it's maybe uh, it's, mm, it's it's rough, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's you might compare still in some cases. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, well, I it would be interesting to know. It would be interesting to know when your paper is out, then uh, what mathematicians could really work on these things. And uh, yeah. So yeah, what, yeah. what will they say? How surprising. I mean, for, for me, it's it's uh, it's very surprising and it's quite amazing that uh, I guess the miracle you know, for me is that, you know, just like for the easy model, is that how close you can get to the actual answer by doing some finite subset of, of the bootstrap constraints. So I guess, yeah. Also for the easy model, the bootstrap equations were known for a long time, but uh, nobody just bothered to check what they give. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so here again, you know, for some amazing reason, you just get very close. So it's it's really interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. It's uh, to me, it looks very interesting. Well, of course, it's the, the consumers, the mathematicians, will judge eventually. Yeah. yeah, when I when I spoke to some mathematicians here at the institute, they were they were quite excited. But uh, I mean, they they also really love hyperbolic surfaces here at the institute. So maybe they're a bit biased. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, let me stop the recording.